Thank you for being here in person there online. It's always, always, always such an honor uh, to do this together. Hey, just before we jump in today and start our new series, I want to make an invitation to you. Um, you guys know we've been talking about it now for a couple of months that uh, our family is headed back toward the mission field. And so uh, today at four o'clock, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at 7 o'clock, Elaine and I are just going to be hosting some small events up here in the cafe at church. So if you want to drop by, we sent out an email about it a couple of weeks ago, but you know, if your schedule has changed or if you just want to come by, you don't have to make a reservation. You can just come uh, and join us today at 4, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at 7. And we just wanted to share our hearts with you a little bit about what we're doing. That way, if you had questions like, you know, where is it that you are going and what is all of this about? Out. We'd love to have an opportunity to, to talk with you guys. We had one last night and had a great time, uh, just the chance to, to hang out together as family. So today at four, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at seven, we'd, we'd love to have you join us if God puts that on your heart. Okay, let me, let, let's talk about this today. Um, have you ever had a physical wound, right? Most of us have. You've had a bruise, you've had a scratch, you've had a scar, something has happened, you've cut yourself, you've hurt yourself. Well, physical wounds, the thing about them, they hurt, but they typically heal. The body heals itself. So, so as the wound heals, we begin to get over it, and most of the time, almost all of the time, as the wound heals, we move on and then the body functions like it's supposed to, as if the wound wasn't there. We might, might, not, might have a scar, but it's like everything moves on as if the wound wasn't there. It doesn't continually affect us. Physical wounds. Well, what I want to talk about today, though, is a little bit different. I want to talk about emotional wounds or wounds of the heart. So every one of us has been wounded. Every one of us carries some type of relational disappointment or relational tragedy or relational wound. Maybe you lost someone in your life too soon. Maybe you've experienced what, what no parent should ever have to experience, the, the, the death of a child. Maybe, maybe it was a loss of a relationship. Maybe it was a marriage that failed, a friendship that failed. Maybe in your life you are a child of divorced parents and you carry that emotional wound with you. Maybe you, you had an absentee parent. Maybe your parents said and did horrible things. Maybe there were people in your life that were abusive and spoke horrible things over you. Every one of us experiences relational wounds, relational tragedies. All of us have a story. And I know this. So I've been doing this for a while and talked to a lot of people. Few people, very few people, deal with wounds of the heart properly. Most of us don't really deal with it at all, right? We, we take that common worldly wisdom that says, time will heal all wounds, but we know the truth. No, it won't, right? It doesn't heal everything. We may stuff it, we may ignore it, we may try to block it, we may try to overcome it. But the Bible even says, the longer you hold on to those things, the deeper the hurt, and it begins to bring some things out in us. So, so we're in a brand new series called Do Family Better. And you might be thinking, well, why are you talking about emotional wounds? Well, I, I felt like this week. So, so when, when, when we start a new series, as I think about Sundays around here, you know, I'm, I'm usually praying several weeks before, sometimes even longer about, hey, God, just put some direction on my heart. And things. Well, I felt like God stopped me in my tracks this week and said, hey, there's, there's something we need to talk about first. Because here was the thought, to be able to do family better, we gotta be able to do ourselves a little bit better. Because a lot of times in your relationships, you know what the problem is? You, right? Because you're in every relationship that you have. You're like, I can never have a relationship with anybody. Well, what's the common denominator? You, right? We, we carry these things around with us. And we never deal with them. And they affect all the relationships that we have. So we're gonna look at this heart wound that many of us have and, and, and kind of how do we begin the process? So, so that when we talk about things out of God's word, because here's the deal, I could give you the best explanation of what the Bible says that about marriage, about family, about relationships. I mean, it could all be laid out to where it was simple and doable, but the deal is if we don't heal this, the best advice doesn't make a bit of difference. It's just good stuff that we never 
get to. So I want to start off with a, a story from the Bible. It's probably one of those unfamiliar stories. It's in part of the Bible, there's names listed there. There's not a lot in uh, uh, extra about this story. So you've probably read it if you are a person that kind of does that. You know, you ever read through the Bible in a year or read through portions. And if you're like me, sometimes you read through some of them really quickly, you know, especially when they get to those genealogies. So-and-so had so-and-so names you can't pronounce. You're like, and there's another one and another one and another one and another one. And, and, but sometimes in those parts, these things that if you slow down a minute, they make you think, okay, what's, what might be going on here? Now, there's not a lot about it, about this story, but it makes you think some things might be possible. They might be happening in this story. So this is a story, a, a little glimpse of a guy that we're not from, from, very familiar with named Terah. Now, Terah, we're very familiar with one of his sons, Abraham, right? Abraham, the father of our faith. This is his Dad, and if you remember, God calls Abraham. He says, I want you to leave your land where you are living and I wanna take you to the promised land. Everybody remember that? What was the name of that land? Canaan. I, I wanna take you into Canaan, the promised land. Remember the description? It's a place flowing with milk and honey. It's a place of God's blessing. It's a place to live out the life that God has for you. So, so if we were to bring that up today in a spiritual place, it may not be a physical Canaan, but what if there was a spiritual Canaan, a place where you could go, where you could begin to live the life God had for you. Your, your relationships were like flowing with milk and honey. It was things that were wonderful and, and you were experiencing God's best in your life. Well, I found this amazing, never really seen it before in here, that Abraham wasn't the first one to start heading toward Canaan. Look, look at this story. This is the account of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. And we read about him later, him and Abraham together. While his father was still alive, Haran, his son, died. He died in Ur of the Chaldees in the land of his birth. So, so he's raising his family. And then he experiences what no parent should ever have to go through. One of his kids died. Now, some scholars believe that, that Heron, even though he's listed last, sometimes they would do that, that Heron was actually the firstborn. So you can imagine in that culture, it's not just the son, it's your firstborn son. That's things that we don't understand, but that carried a lot. This was the son of promise. This was the son of blessing. This was the son who, who would eventually grow up and take care of, of everyone, take care of his mom, take care of the family, take care of his siblings. I mean, that's why they, they received an extra portion of inheritance and so here he is, and, and his son dies, and he's dealing with that. What, what, what must he have felt? The pain of that, the hurt of that. So Terah took his son Abram, and we know later as Abraham, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, the wife of the son Abraham, Abram. And together, they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to where? Canaan. Huh. Now, God didn't call him there, but we know later that's the land of milk and honey. That's the land of promise. So even before God calls Abraham there, Terah sets out in that direction. He sets out to find this life, this place of God's blessing. But when they came to Herod, now, it's not his son, it's the name of a town. Now, in English, it sounds exactly the same. I don't just speak Hebrew, um, so I'm not sure why they, they translate it exactly the same. In Hebrew, it's written just slightly different, but I wonder if in Hebrew there must have been some similarities in how the words were said. So can you imagine? You've lost your son. You're still trying to live out going to the land of promise, so your, your heart is hurt. You're still trying to move forward to God, and then you end up at a place that reminds you of your hurt. You ended a place that all of those things begin to come back up in you. And look what he does. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. On his way to the promised land, on his way to Canaan, and yet he settles in Haran. Settles there, lives there for the rest of his life, dies in Haran. Now I know, maybe you go like, Michael, you're reading a little bit into the story. Well, maybe, but that's all we get. And so my thoughts are this. What, what kept him from Canaan. Why did he settle in Haran? Was, was his hurt so great in his life that he just couldn't continue to find what God had out there for him? 
to find the land of promise. He doesn't get close to where he was going. So I think about that, I thought, you know, there's, there's us, those of us in this room joining us online, that if you were honest, you would say, there's some areas in my life that I, I think I've settled in Heron. You know, Michael, that divorce, I've just allowed it to define me. What they said about me, how they hurt me, when they left me, what they did, the things that went on. I just, I just been carrying that and I've allowed that to affect every relationship I've ever had since then. Maybe it was the loss of someone, maybe it was how your mom and dad treated you and you said, that's, that's defined me. It's messed me up. I carry it around with me. It's become my identity. That bullying when I was a kid, what those people said, what they did, man, I, I, it hurts so bad. The pain has affected me so much. It has become a part of me. And I crossed, I thought I got a hold of it, but I crossed this place one time and all of those floods, all those memories came flooding back and I just kind of settled there. And, and, and I, believe, I, be, I believe there's better I believe there's better relationships, better marriage, better friendships, better, better, better relationship with my family and with a parent or my adult children or, or, or me and my parents. I just kind of got stuck. So I, I think there's a couple of things. When, when we have that emotional wound, when those things are, are going on, I put a couple of things down on your outline. When we carry our hurt around, it affects all our relationships. So you think carrying that hurt around just is affecting you. It doesn't just affect you. It affects your friendships. It affects how you treat people. It affects the people that are closest to you. You ever, you ever had that friend that every now and then they would just blow up on you to the point at the end you're going, why am I even friends with them anymore? I, I, I mean, it, it, it's crazy. It's just coming from a place you're like, I don't even understand how this continues to come up. Or maybe you're that person. You're carrying some wound around and you blow up at people. You're smart, elocated people. You're mean to people. And really, you know deep down it has very little to do with them. As a matter of fact, sometimes you even go, I don't know why I'm like that. Why do I say that? Why did that come out? But you've been dealing with that hurt so long. It just spills out. I mean, look at look what the Bible says in Hebrews. A bitter spirit. So, so when you're wounded in your heart and you don't deal with it, it grows into bitterness. Always, every time, hurt grows into bitterness. A bitter spirit is not only bad in itself, not only does it hurt you, but can also poison the lives of many others. That answers a lot of questions, right? When people are spewing, you go, oh, hmm, wonder if there's a little bitter spirit there. Wonder if something else is going on. It answers a lot of questions to us that this poison comes out. Now, here's the deal. This is what's odd. Most of the time, the poison comes out. Who does it come out on? It comes out on those who are closest to us. Right? Because we can fake it with people we don't know very well. Right? If we're in a casual, hey, how you doing? God bless you. Good to see you. All right. High five, handshake, love you. God is good all the time. Man, our house life, life's wonderful. All right? And then we get home and it's like, ah! right? it, 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 it hurts the people around us. And so, so when we talk about doing family better, doing relationships better, friendships better, we can't get a hold of that until we begin to deal with the hurt in here. Until we realize this poison that's coming out of us. Now, so, so what happens when you're bitter? One, you become defensive. That's where it often starts. You just, you know, I'm not gonna let that happen again. Nobody's gonna get close to me. Somebody caught you, you know, you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna shut them down before they ever get close. I'm gonna try a little bit and you don't do it my way. I'm gonna let you know how I feel because I'm not going there again. Or you get distant, you push people off. Not gonna let anybody close anymore. I mean, Michael, I know you talk about small groups there, but I ain't getting that close to anybody ever again. You become demanding. Wanting your way, it's gotta be your way. It's gotta be just like this. You've been through one marriage, two marriage, three marriage. And you just go, I just, I just can't because I can't ever overcome. It's never perfectly my way. You, you know what I've noticed? People that deal with this and continue to carry the hurt. I, I, I often watch as, as they begin to seek validation in all the wrong places, in all the wrong relationships. So, so they're carrying a wound from childhood and they continue to seek after somebody that's gonna heal that hurt. 
And yet what they find is nobody can ever heal that hurt. It keeps to prove to somebody, I'm really not like that and it's really not that, that bad and, 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 and I can do this. And so we constantly chase after these things to prove that we're okay, to cover it up, to make it go away. It begins to affect all of our relationships. Here's another one. Carrying your hurt keeps you from your potential. Not only does it affect the relationships around it, it affects you. It causes you to settle in a place that you never thought you'd settle. It causes you to stop pursuing the best that God has for you. You'll never get to where you're trying to go if you don't deal with that hurt. You live paralyzed by that wound. As a matter of fact, here's what happens, and I watch this in people. When, when, that, when that wound begins to dominate your life and it rises up in you, you make crazy decisions. You, you, make, you make decisions that at any other point in your life you would never make. Right? You, you would tell friends, don't make that decision. Don't go there. Don't go out with them. Don't do that. Don't say that. And yet you yourself, it's just coming out. Look, look what the Bible says. Love this scripture. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, right? I'm hurt and it turned into bitterness. I was, and we could make this modern English, stupid, right? I, I mean, I know what is, I was senseless and ignorant. Isn't, isn't that stupid? Yeah, the Bible says when, when you're not dealing with this, you're just dumb. You just make dumb decisions. You're, you're acting out of emotion and you're acting out of hurt and you're doing things that at other points in life you would never do. Listen, when the enemy is attacking you and he's coming out of you, at you and he's whispering those lies, the things that never should have happened, things that were done and things that were said and telling you you'll never be and he's, you're, you're allowing them to define you. He's not just trying to wreck your relationships. He's trying to wreck you. And he's trying to keep you from reaching the place that God has for you. The devil used Haran to keep Terah from Canaan. Where have you settled in Haran? And just allowed that hurt to keep you from moving forward. Here's another one. Carrying your hurt impedes your relationship with God. Now, this one's tough. We don't like this. But we have got to understand this. The vertical relationship affects the horizontal relationships yeah. and the horizontal relationships affect our vertical relationship. It's the way God has made us. As a matter of fact, read 1 John, 1 John 4, I think it's in, in verse 10, the Bible says, um, how can you say you love God and hate your brother? Right? If you hate your brother, the love of God isn't in you. We go, wait, 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 wait. I can love God and hate these people. No, you can't. The, the Bible says these always go together. It's why Jesus, when he puts out the, the greatest commandment, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because they go hand in hand. Because they affect each other. As a matter of fact, look at this. Here's what the Bible says. When you are praying, okay, so it's talking about us, our relationship. Pastor Mike, I can come in. I can pray. I can have a relationship with God. Okay, well, let's look at that. When you're praying, first, forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that there's a reason so that your father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Okay, let me read that again because I'm like, you got it. When you are praying, I'm at church, I'm worshiping, I'm raising my hands, I'm singing the song, I'm praying, I'm talking to God, I'm working on this relationship, letting him lead me to the land of promise. When you're praying first, before anything else, first, forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against. Not that's holding a grudge against you. Anyone you're holding a grudge against. But Michael, they're not even sorry. Well, I don't see that in there anywhere. That when they're sorry. But Michael, I told them. I forgive them. And they didn't even say anything. They just went on like nothing. I don't see that in there anywhere that it has very little to do with them, everything to do with you and your relationship with God. Forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. So here's what I want you to do real quick. Close your eyes. All right, real quick. Think about someone you have a grudge against. Okay, open your eyes, because that's as long as it takes, right? Boom, you know right off. You're like, this person, I was already thinking about him before you said that. 
Why is this so important? Because God knows to be able to receive what only God can give you, you've got to be willing to extend it to others. It's the way it works. You've got to be willing to extend forgiveness to fully receive forgiveness. Look, th- th- this even shows up in the Lord's Prayer. Look at this. Some of you might not want to pray this prayer after we talk about it today. All right. It says, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Now, now, now pause right there. Could that mean, God, I'm asking you to extend the same forgiveness you extend to me that I forgive to other people? Because if it means that, then you go like, hmm, I might not want to pray that right now because I don't know that I'm ready to forgive. I don't know that I'm ready to deal with this. So if we're asking God, hey, as I extend this, Lord, I'm I'm asking you to move in my life, which that's the prayer, then, then this is the most important message of your life because it's not just about your relationships with other people. It's actually about your relationship with God. Forgive us as we forgive. For if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. This isn't just about making your marriage better, fixing your kids, making sure your home's at at peace. This is about you and God. And this may answer some questions of why your relationship with God never seems to be moving forward. Maybe because God is saying, because there's some things we gotta deal with. There's some hurt inside of you that you can't just ignore any longer. There's some things going on that you think, I I, I thought about it like this. If we had more time today, I I, I would do this for you, but I was gonna have you grab a small object, maybe try this uh, at home sometime. Grab a small object, grab like even a pen and hold it out in front of you. And at first it doesn't mean nothing. I hold this forever. No, you can't. Because an hour from now, what's gonna be happening? Your body is gonna be racked with pain. Doesn't seem like a big deal. The longer you hold it, becomes a huge deal. It'll affect your whole physical body. You're holding on to that hurt. And today you may might, might try to convince yourself that it's not affecting you. It is affecting everything. It's affecting you. It's affecting those around you. It's affecting your relationship with God. It's affecting your walk with God because you can't experience all that he has for you until you begin to extend that to other people. So, so, so let's talk about some ways we can move into healing. To do family better, I have to engage in the process of healing. As a matter of fact, the Bible makes the invitation. He heals, talking about God, heals the brokenhearted, binds up their wounds. He, he helps us not only as he, as he begins to do the work in healing, he helps us to begin to think different. Look at this challenge out of 2 Corinthians. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does, right? We just don't get back. We just don't, we just don't throw people away. We just don't overcome it. We just don't let time heal it. We, we have different weapons. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. Talking about in our relationship with God, talking about prayer, talking about applying his word to our lives. They have divine power to demolish Strongholds. Now, we talked about this word strongholds here before. This word strongholds in this context, in this scripture, you know what it means? It means a lie believed as the truth. It means somewhere along the line, the enemy has whispered into your ear and it's locked in your mind. See, you'll never be. You can never have a good marriage. Your kids are never gonna like you. You're you're never gonna restore that relationship. It's always gonna be a failure. It's never gonna be right. All men are the same. All women are evil. Whatever it is that the enemy keeps telling you, you know, you'll never be. You're never gonna reach the land of promise. You know what your parents told you when you were a kid? That is true. You remember what that bully said about you? You remember what that person did to you? And what happens? They become strongholds in our lives. They become lies that live here. And, and, and we've said this before, and you guys know this. A lie believed as truth will be acted on as truth in your life. Doesn't matter how much somebody else tells you it's a lie. When you buy into the lie, it becomes your truth. And so no wonder you've settled in Heron. 
Because you believe that instead of believing what God says about you, that, that you are more, that you are an overcomer, that you are victorious, that he can restore and rebuild all the broken things in your life. This goes on like it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought, right? The lies, we go, well, nope, that's a lie from the enemy. I don't have to settle there. That doesn't have to identify me anymore. I can restore my relationships, I can start new relationships, and I can move to God's promised land for me. The knowledge of God, and we take, it capt- we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So, so I wanna talk about a few of those truths, some ways that may not be conventional, may not always wanna do them, but when we apply the word of God we begin to tear down these strongholds in our life. So here's the first one. You wanna begin the process of healing. You gotta confess the hurt. Can I just tell you, God already knows. He's God. I let him know, God, I'm good. And God's going, no, you're really not. God, this doesn't bother me. This doesn't affect anything. And God's like, "Eh, look at the mess you're making. You know, look at this. And, and, And yet we're so afraid and, and, and maybe it's like, well, I know it's there, Michael. I just don't want to go there. Isn't it time to start healing? Yes. You can wait. How, how long do you want to wait? But when I start that process now, as God is inviting you, this message today, and you're like, uh, this is not the message I wanted to hear right now. But maybe it's just God's way of getting your attention to say, hey, let, let's Let's start this. Let's begin this process. We're gonna do that at, at, at the end. We, you know, we always have a time of worship and we're gonna give you the opportunity. Maybe you, wanna, maybe you wanna pray with someone. Maybe you wanna find a place to pray. But that's where it all begins, of opening ourselves up to God. He knows anyway. He's just waiting on us to go, okay, God, I need you. Not only do we confess to God, we confess to each other. The Bible talks about confess your sins one another. I think you could put hurts in there, those bitterness, the things you're hanging on to so that we may be healed. You you know the reason we push for small groups and serve teams, all all the things, they're all important. That you find your purpose, that the ministry of the church moves forward, that that this is a place that that, that when you come in, you love to come in. Can, Can I give you the bottom line, and maybe I've not said it enough, but when we started on this journey several years ago, Here was the reason for all of, the underlying reason for all of that is my greatest hope was that you would make a friend. The church wouldn't just be something you do. You didn't just show up and sit in a seat or show up and greet the door and wave at people and smile. But at some point in your life, you would cross paths with someone heading in the same direction. And together, you would be able to build a strong relationship so that when God starts dealing with you in things like this, you've got somebody to go to, to talk to about it. We are always, always, always stronger together. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about if we hold on to these things. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Right? It, it like eats us up on the inside when we, when we can't share it and help people get perspective and walk out that healing. But when I was silent and still, not even saying anything good, my anguish increased we gotta gotta confess this, we gotta bring it out. Can can I give you another one? Sometimes you need counseling. We are not a place that is averse to counseling. Sometimes I have been to a counselor, my wife's been to a counselor, we've been to a counselor together, my kids have been to counselors, we send people to counselors. Going to counseling is not a lack of faith. There are Christian men and women that have trained themselves, that have studied, that have experienced, that have walked through life with so many people and sometimes the best thing for you is to find one of them and go, I just need some perspective. It's not magic, but it helps. So the first part is confessing our hurt. Not stuffing it, not letting time heal all wounds, but confessing it. Here's the next one. Okay, I'll just give you a hint. It doesn't get any easier, all right? So here we go. (laughs) Pray for those who hurt you. You'd be like, oh yeah, I pray for them. I pray for them every day, Pastor Mario. (laughs) <laughs> Let me tell you what I pray, God. You know that lightning bolt right there. You know, come on, zap them out. Okay, we're not talking about those kind of prayers. Jesus on the cross, never did anything wrong. It's perfect, lived a perfect life. 
And people turn on him, heard him say all kinds of horrible things, beat him, nail him to a cross. And what does he say? Father, forgive them. Praying for them. So walking through this, he, he's, he's sharing with us what this looks like. And so he tells people, he's talking to people that, that are just gathered around listening to his words. And he says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. And I always think, you know, we read it because we can read ahead. I think he probably paused there and everybody's like, that is right. What a good statement. I love the people that are good to me. I hate the people that aren't. Did you know in Rome, they actually had a God that was the God of revenge? You know, what a great God to have. Like, okay, I'm gonna pray to him for a little bit. You know, and then I'll pray to him for a little bit because it was part of who they are. And so Jesus is talking, he's saying, hey, y'all know this. As a matter of fact, Jewish people, they were eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's the way we live. You do it to me, I do it back to you. So Jesus is coming along, turning everything upside down. You're gonna live in the kingdom. You're gonna learn how to walk out healing. You're gonna learn to move into the promised land. He says, I know you heard that said, but I tell you, love your enemies. To which we've heard it before, so it doesn't have the impact that all of them would have probably, you know, a, an audible gasp, like, what? That's impossible. That's not the way this works. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who've spoken mean things about you. Pray for those who have said mean things. Pray for those who hurt you. Listen, I understand you don't want to. There's a lot of times I don't want to either, but let me tell you this. Sometimes it takes right actions to trigger right feelings. You wait for the feelings to come first, you may never feel it. You wait for the desire to come first. What happens when you don't really desire it? Sometimes it takes the application of God's word to begin to change your heart. Sometimes it takes right actions to trigger right feelings. There have been times in my life, people have hurt me. I've carried hurt from, from things that happened many, many years ago, hurt from, from things that happened more recent. People say things and they do things and you just think, wow, it just hurts and it begins to separate the relationship. And I, I, I walk through this with you and I go, okay, God, I may not feel like I want to, but, but I, I'm gonna pray for them when, when I can get there. It's not always right away. I'm not that spiritual, but you know, when I finally get there, I pray for them. And here's what happens. Even if they don't change, I change. That's right. yes. That's right. yes. And even if they continue to hurt, you know what? It hurts less, still hurts but it doesn't affect my life like it used to. And, and here's a really unique thing that's happened on occasion. God's actually allowed me to feel, I can't think of a better word, hurt for them. Because I think if, if you're that bitter, if you're gonna spew out like that and send it like that and write it like that and say it like that, there must be something going on in your life or that happened to you that I just need to pray for you. That God would help you to heal it, 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 it changes us. It may be difficult. I don't want to minimize the pain. I am not saying this is easy at all. Not like a light switch. I'm telling you, you begin to practice that. All of a sudden, what you'll find is you'll find that hurt process begins to, to start healing. Here's another one. I'm just giving you this one as a freebie. Guard your tongue. When you're hurt, you say things that you wish you never said. Right? All of us do. To, to begin the process of healing, sometimes you gotta, you know, I do this with my 13 year old. I'm like, oh, you know? So maybe you do that to yourself. You're like, oh, you know, just close it down. The Bible says in Psalm, God put a guard over my mouth, or in Proverbs, it says, those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. Isn't that good? You put a guard over here, guess what? Man, there'd just be less junk going on in your life, less calamity. The Bible says this, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. What a great message. You don't have to get everybody back. You don't have to lash out. Listen, it ain't winning you no points. It's keeping you in heron. It ain't moving you into the promised land. You may think, I got them. Well, guess what? You just locked yourself down, missing out on God's best for you. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because, look at this, so instead, 
You turn around and bless them. You turn around and pray for them. Repay evil with blessing because this, to this you were called, right? This is our, our, our calling as a Christian to live out our kingdom identity. This you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. So that you may pick up your stuff from the land of Haran and begin to move towards Canaan. You may inherit God's best in your life. You may begin to live out his promise, but it takes some, some action on our part. All right, here's the next one. You gotta forgive. We already talked a little bit about forgiveness. This is who we are as people of God. It's a spiritual act that we need to practice. We need to get better at it. We need, we need to do it because God has told us to do it. We need to do it because it's our, it's our biblical responsibility. But you also need to do it because the longer you hold on to unforgiveness, the more it affects you. The more it eats at you. And I know they don't deserve it. And I know what they did was horrible. And you say, but Michael, listen, you don't know my story. I, I know. These messages are never, ever, 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 ever easy. But if you want to be healed... It does come a point where you gotta start to say, okay, God, I'm, I'm confessing and I'm praying for him. I'm holding my tongue. Now, God, would, would, would you help me to forgive? I, I love, Peter, Peter's going through this. Like, God, how many times do we have to forgive? Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. You know what Jesus was saying? He said, this is your identity, Peter. It's who you are. It's not about trying to keep score. It's not about a record. It's saying, hey, I live in a completely different way. Jesus, Jesus modeled this. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate when he suffered. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. God, I know they said, oh, I know they heard, but Lord, I'm, I'm walking this with you. I'm not out to get him. I'm just, I just, I wanna be right with you. Show me, Father, how to let it go, how to forgive. One last one, and then we're gonna pray. Refocus on God's plan for your life, for your family. So where have you settled in Heron? Oh, I just thought marriage could be like, and I just thought my, my, my family and my kids could be like, all I need is some tips and all that, but maybe there's a place in your life where you just kind of lock down because you go, I just don't think I can. I can't be a good dad. I didn't have an example. Michael, I've screwed it up 10 times. I can't have a good marriage. I mean, I, I try to have friends. I, I, can't, I can't even have a, a friendship goes beyond a day or two or a week or two. Where have you settled in? And what is God's plan for you? You know what it is? Wholeness, healing, blessing. Blessing doesn't mean that life's not difficult. Blessing just means God's activity in the midst of difficulty. The land of promise. Don't let the hurt, the incident, the wound stop you from what God wants to do in your life. Don't let it derail you from all God has for you. Don't allow it to cause you to settle in the pain and the hurt and forgo and miss the healing that God has for you. Love this. Anybody had the right to be bitter, it was Joseph. You need to go back and read his story. Family turns against him, right? I mean, it, even sometimes you're wondering, like, God, where are you in this? People keep turning against him. And at the end of it all, he goes, am I in the place of God? God look, look, all of that, and here I stand. God had lifted him up, moved him to a place of promise. He was now a ruler. His family was groveling. He goes, am I not in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. You're looking at your life, you go, look, I, you, you, you know what? And I'm, I'm not a big, we should fight the devil on our own. Ain't nobody that strong. But you know what? There are times when you can look at him and go, devil, you are lying to me. Yes. And what you tried to throw at me that you thought was gonna end up destroying my life, God has turned it around. And guess what? I'm a stronger person now. I got a better marriage now. I got better friendships now. I got a better family now because what you meant for evil, God has turned it around and brought good in my life. Here's the last scripture and we're gonna pray. This is my hope for you today. Put your heart right. 
reach out to God. That's what we're gonna do in just a moment. First part of that, confessing our hurt, bringing it to God, that's where it all starts. Then look at this, then face the world again. Get right with God, and he'll give you a new outlook on life. Then face the world again, firm and courageous. Then all your troubles will fade from your memory like floods that are past and remembered no more. Will you bow your heads with me? God, messages like this are never easy to deal with. They bring up things in us, Lord, that we don't wanna think about. But God, I pray, would, would you captivate us in these few moments? Maybe for the first time in a long time. Let's not, let us not run from this. Would you help us to begin to deal with it? So Lord, I invite your presence in to speak to our hearts as only you can. As you lead each of us as individuals, to maybe deal with the hurt, confess it to you. And while we spend this time in your presence to begin to receive spiritual healing so that we have the courage to put your word into practice, to pray for and to forgive those who have hurt us so that we can live the life you have for us. Lord, I pray for anyone here today or joining us on life, they don't know you. God, let them know they don't have to do this alone. You love them so much, you sent your son. Jesus came and died for them on the cross so they could be forgiven and free so that you could make them whole. Would you lead them to the place today where they would just look in your direction and say, God, I need you. Speak to their hearts, draw them in. Those of us who are followers, Lord, help us not to settle in the land of Herod, but today to recognize where our hurt has been controlling our lives and invite you in to heal us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.